Hello everyone and welcome to the March Virtual Planetarium and as ever we will start with the inner solar system with the planet Mercury which can be found in the morning sky but it's really not very well placed at all. On the 1st of March it's at magnitude minus 0.1 and lies around 2 degrees southwest of Saturn which is at magnitude 0.9 rising about 30 minutes before the sun um, but then things don't get much better after that, so <laughs> it's going to be quite a tough one to see, Mercury. It's not going to be easy at all, is it? Venus is a different um, matter altogether, of course. Venus is a morning object at present, rising about two hours before the sun. I mean, they don't get particularly high, these planets. It's, um, it's not a good part of the sky early morning in the spring because the ecliptic is quite shallow to the horizon but you should yeah. be able to see venus because it's um it's very bright even though it will be pretty low down so if you look for it um, at the beginning of the month for example about 40 minutes before sunrise it'll be about 10 degrees up which isn't excessive but it should be <laughs> it should be visible um, and it reaches dichotomy this month which is the the fancy term for saying that it, re it appears as a 50% lit globe. So you'll see it as a semicircle through the eyepiece of your telescope. Now, dichotomy is controversial with Venus, isn't it? Yes, that's right. It uh, it's never happens quite at the predicted time because of a phenomenon known as the Schroeter effect, or more recently it's been called the phase anomaly. Uh, and we think this is because uh, the atmosphere of Venus, which is very thick, scatters the light. So the phase, as predicted, is never quite that uh, as you observe it. It's always... Uh, a little bit less when you observe it. So uh, that's an interesting effect to look out for. It could be noticeable in even quite a small telescope. Yes, well, it sh Venus should reach dichotomy on the 21st of March. And in the morning sky, it's um, the 50% phase arrives late, doesn't it? It's early in the evening and late in the morning. Yes, that's right. So it wouldn't be surprising if you find that Venus isn't actually 50% illuminated three or four days maybe after that. It's slight variation. It's never the same each time because Venus's atmosphere is very dynamic. But it is worth watching around for that time to see if you can determine when the, the Terminator on Venus is a perfect straight line with no sort of curvature to it at all because that's when it's 50% illuminated. OK, well, that's made more difficult because of the low altitude, of course, and poor seeing. Um, but it, there are other things to look out for with Venus because Mars and Saturn will appear close to Venus this month. Saturn will be too close to the Sun to see properly at the start of March, but it's clearly visible together with Venus and Mars towards the end of the month. On the 25th of March, Venus sits 4.6 degrees from Mag plus 1.1 Mars and 4.1 degrees from plus 0.9 Saturn, although the squat triangle formed by the three planets fails to gain significant altitude above the southeast horizon as sunrise approaches. Um, there's another nice meeting, actually, on the 28th of March, when an 18% waning crescent moon lies below the trio. So those are all quite nice little events, and you can they don't require any telescope or binoculars to see at all. Um, sticking on with Mars, um, it is, as Pete just said, visible in the morning sky sky, uh, rising some 90 minutes before the sun uh, now, but on the 1st of March it'll appear 5 degrees below magnitude minus 4.4 Venus. Uh, and over the next few mornings, Mars and Venus will appear to come closer and closer together in the morning sky, uh, with both planets separated by just 4 degrees on the 12th of March. So that'd be quite nice, but they'll be rather low down. That's quite good, yes. Mar and Mars is still quite small telescopically, we should point out. It's only about, what, five seconds of arc in <laughs> apparent diameter by the end of March, so really not a lot to see uh, on, on the surface of Mars at the moment. Imaging, of course, you might pull out more detail. It's just this low altitude which causes a problem with Mars at the moment because it's tiny and its light has to pass through a very thick layer of atmosphere. So it's really difficult to get a stable view of it. But of course it will get a lot better towards the end of the year, reaching opposition in December 2022, which is actually a good one for the UK. It is because it's a, a season opposition where Mars is quite high in the sky and at a reasonable disk diameter as well. So should be quite good and I'm looking forward to that already. OK, well, Jupiter is really unlikely to be seen this month um, because uh, it reaches solar conjunction on the 5th and despite drawing away from the sun's position reasonably rapidly, it just doesn't gain much altitude. 
And on the 31st of March, for example, magnitude minus 1.9 Jupiter rises just 20 minutes before the Sun, which isn't really very helpful. Saturn is a bit further across to the west. So Saturn is a little bit more advanced in terms of its distancing from the Sun, but it's still not particularly well placed at the moment, is it? No, I think we can summarise both these planets up by saying really low down and hard to see further. <laughs> not, not much there, unfortunately. Uranus, however, probably the best placed planet in the solar system for observation in the northern hemisphere of the Earth, is magnitude 5.9. And you can see it uh, on the 1st of March, that's the best time to catch it, 30 degrees above the west-south horizon as true darkness arrives on the 1st of March. Uh, so that's a good time to catch it. But by mid-March, the planet will be... Uh, <laughs> Moving out of the way, really, and we'll yeah. be getting towards the end of, what's, of what we can do with Uranus for this opposition. Yes, the window is closing on Uranus, and the same is true with Neptune. In fact, it's worse for Neptune because it's in conjunction with the Sun on the 13th of March. Um, thereafter, it moves into the morning sky where all the planets seem to be heading at the moment. <laughs> so you'll have to get up early to do some planetary observing. Uh, let's have a look at some specials which are occurring this month. We've got um, a relatively nice appearance of Comet 19P Borrelly, um, which is relatively bright throughout uh, March and is well placed as it passes from Aries into southern Perseus. Um, we we won't describe it here. If you want to find out more details, then turn to the magazine Sky Guide, where you'll find a location chart for the comet. Yes, and also we on the 5th of March, um, you can catch an early evening 10% lit waxing crescent moon. And with the libration, you should be able to see three locked seas over the Mare Humboldtianum in the north, the Mare Smythe, and the Mare Marginis to the east. And the moon's rocking backwards and forwards is what we call the, this libration effect. And uh, it's currently favourable for viewing these otherwise quite difficult lunar features. So uh, that's what to look out for. Yeah, they, they stand out quite well. Yeah, they, they're like dark, well, they are dark lava basins, basically. Um, they do stand out quite well on the moon's eastern edge and we should point out that with the moon um, the eastern edge if we're looking at it from the UK is on the right hand side. Yes I always quite amusing Patrick I remember Patrick bemoaning about that because it means the Mare Orientale the eastern sea is on the western limb of the moon the system was <laughs> changed around by the IAU I think in the 60s and as a result, uh, all these names changed. But uh, yes, yeah, so sticking with the moon, actually, on the 8th, there's a nice event. 35% uh, lit waxing crescent moon lies just 4.1 degrees south of the Pleiades open cluster in Taurus. That's a nice thing to look out for, actually, and a nice photographic target as well. Yes. And on the 19th, in the morning sky, the full moon just a little bit past full, actually, occults the binary star system Porima, or Gamma Virginis, as dawn is breaking. Oh, yeah. Uh, disappearance, I think, occurs at 0552, so that's from the centre of the UK uh, in the morning. So that'll be quite a tough one to see, but quite interesting because uh, Porima is quite a nice binary, so be interesting to watch that. It's a tight binary. Yeah, It. I mean, a few years back, you couldn't split Porima, even with a, a massive telescope, uh, but now the two stars there. I, th I can't remember what their orbital period is. Um, it's about, is it 150 years? Something like that. I might be wrong on that. Um, but it, it, they basically, they are moving apart, which is amazing, really. So you can split them now if you've got good seeing and a medium-sized telescope. But, um, yeah, it be an interesting thing to, to watch out for. I do like lunar occultations of stars. I do. I just never get to catch any because it's always cloudy <laughs> uh, from my location when there's, a, when there's an event like that happening. But I don't know, maybe one day. Maybe this one will be clear for that. You never know. Well, something you don't need to actually have clear skies for is on the, occurs on the 20th when at 1533 UT the centre of the sun's disk crosses the celestial equator, which marks a moment in time, or an instant in time, known as the March equinox, or the northern hemisphere's spring or vernal equinox. Um, but that basically is quite an important time for us astronomers 
it uh, possibly in the negative sense because it means that the length of night is shrinking at the fastest possible rate for the year. Yeah, that is the time when you notice the uh, the evenings really suddenly getting very very light, uh, and the, the acceleration, as you say, is quite noticeable. Uh, of course, yeah. it also means things are warming up a little bit. And it's you don't have to freeze to death outside observing. <laughs> Not usually, although you can get beasts from the east and various things in, in March that can cool things down a bit. But in generally, it means the weather's going to improve and get a bit better. Yeah. Well, on, on the 23rd of March, uh, around that time anyway, the moon is going to be out of the way. It'll be in the morning sky. So if you're fortunate to have dark skies and clear weather after sunset, keep a look out for the extremely faint glow of the zodiacal light over towards the west. It looks like a sort of inclined cone of light. It's very, very subtle, very difficult to see, quite large, um, and it's basically caused by dust in the solar system scattering sunlight, which is running along the length of the ecliptic. Have you ever seen it? Not from Leicester, because the zodiacal light from Leicester City uh, tends to... Wouldn't have a chance, tends, no. To, no, it tends to outshine. I think... Didn't we see it from La Palma? Possibly. I can't remember. I... I'm sure you pointed it out, and I'm sure we saw it from La Palma. I'm pretty sure... That's the only time. I've never seen it anyone else. I've seen it a few times. It is very, very subtle, though. It is very, uh, very faint. And it, you say it looks like a cone. All I really remember is a, a very diffuse patch of light, even more so than how the Milky Way looks in a, from, a, from a brightly lit city. Uh, I, not really a cone shape, but just sort of phasing out. Uh, no, properly. cone is, is how it's often described. It's not quite right, really. It's a, imagine it like a... Uh, a pointed isosceles triangle. Imagine a pointed isosceles triangle on the horizon, quite large, going up, I don't know, 50 degrees or so, and then bulge the sides of the triangle out and then smooth the peak over at the top and then incline that along the ecliptic. And that's the shape of the zodiacal light. Yeah, it's quite a tough one to see, isn't it? I, I've not... As I said, I think I've only ever seen it from La Palma. So Cameras might be able to pick it up. This might yes, be worth having a go yeah. with that. Um, but on the 27th, of course, there's going to be a moan now. In the UK, oh. clocks advance <laughs> by one hour at 0100 UT to become 0200 BST, which is the start of the UK's period of daylight saving and confusion will abound. <laughs> yes, if we're out observing that night, then... Uh, that always gets me. I always just write down then. I, I forget it's going to happen and just write down the uh, the new revised time. And then when I look at the observations in the morning, I think, where did the hour go? What, what was I doing? <laughs> oh, yes. The weird one I once had was when I was observing and the observatory clock decided it was going to update there and there. Oh, yes, I've had and that. And it just looked like I was travelling very quickly through time. <laughs> <laughs> very strange. But, yes, so there we have that to contend with. Uh, also on the 30th... Uh, there are a few messier objects that are not currently visible. Uh, it is possible, given clear skies though, to view most of Messier's catalogue over the course of a full night. Um, so give it a try and see how many you can observe. Uh, it's, uh, you can't get all of them, but you can get a good few down at this time of year. Yes, you can. There is an awkward one from the UK, which is Messier 30 in Capricornus, but um, the others are up for grabs, but some of them are difficult because you have to get them in twilight. But it's, um, it's known as the Messier Marathon, and it's quite a nice thing to have a go for, even if you don't get all of them because it sort of draws, it gives you a purpose for going through the Messier catalogue. One fuzzy blob after the other. <laughs> and not all fuzzy blobs, no. and some of them don't actually exist. No. Some of them, like, like M, is it M40 in Ursa Major, which is just just a star, a double star? Yeah, it's, it's uh, a little naughty. Uh, but there we are, there, there are some lovely objects to, to, to look at. And even though some of those objects in Capricorn and Sagittarius are very low down, the clusters in particular, though, still come out quite nicely. Yes, all right, well, let's turn our attention to the the stars because something interesting happens this time of year, and that is the Milky Way, uh, that when you look up and see the Milky Way when the spiral arms of the galaxy in which we live, um, it kind of moves out of the way this month, and our view is, tr is turned towards extragalactic space out into the realm of the galaxies. So this is a good time to pick up some deep sky objects that lie a very great distance away from the Earth. Yes, indeed. So uh, this is a good time to begin looking at those galaxies in Leo and Virgo, 
um, and out into deep, deep space, well away from our own Milky Way. Well, just before we go there, let's just mention that we still have the last vestiges of, uh, of winter. Um, in the West, you can still see the fantastic form of Ryan Hunter, but he is going to go quickly. Um, you've also got Sirius, the dog star, and Canis Major, the great dog. And um, you can still see the constellation of Gemini, the twins, and the two principal stars, Castor and Pollux, almost marking the transition point between the winter and the spring sky. Um, Taurus the bull is still there as well, but he's now quite low down. We mentioned the, the Pleiades earlier, the moon being near the Pleiades, where the Pleiades, of course, are in Taurus. Um, but yeah, you're right. As the as the Milky Way has moved out of the way, then we get to see some rather interesting extra galactic delights, don't we? Yes. Yeah, so there's a number of galaxies uh, that are about at the moment, uh, and in particular, uh, we start to see uh, the return of Leo the Lion. Uh, quite a, I think quite a, a noticeable constellation. It might not be particularly bright, but I think it looks quite distinctive. And the brightest star in Leo is Regulus. Yes. Uh, and uh, you'll know if you've got the right star because it is just to the right of the sickle, an asterism in Leo, which looks like a backward question mark. <laughs> it is the punctuation dot in it as well, isn't it? it I mean, if yeah. you if you find the plough or the saucepan asterism, which is almost overhead close to midnight at this time of year. Then you extend the side of the pan, I'm going to describe it as a saucepan, at the side of the pan which is next to the handle, down with respect to the saucepan. That will eventually bring you to Regulus, which is at the bottom of this backward question mark of, um, of Leo, which represents the lion's head. But the rest of Leo is like a rectangle heading towards the east, and then there's a pointed tail which ends at the star Denebola. And it's below Denebola in a large semicircular pattern, which is known as the Bowl of Virgo, where you'll locate many, many galaxies. This is where um, there's a huge number oh. here. That's that's a re region of sky called the Realm of Galaxies. And it is quite something. If you've got a telescope, just put it on low power, and you're almost guaranteed to see some faint galaxies yes. there. Um, they, they are all rather delicate, and... You need to, if you're going to do this visually, you need to make sure you're really well dark adapted. So yes, you do. Make, make sure you've been out in the dark, away from any bright light for at least half an hour, forty minutes. Do you know it can be quite a tricky region to navigate because the bowl of Virgo is large; it's very big. Um, it is. And uh, the the bottom of the bowl, by the way, is is marked by Gamma Virginis or Porima, which is the star we mentioned earlier, which is going to be occulted by the moon, but. Um, the bowl is very large, and there's not much in it to give you any guidance. No. There's one one sort of naked eye star that stands out, which is, uh, if I remember correctly, it's Rho Virginis. But there's nothing much else. So you basically, you've you've just got to get to the right region to locate your first galaxies. And then once you've got them, if you can identify them properly, you can use those galaxies to galaxy hop to the other galaxies which are there. Yes, and there's a number of quite distinctive galaxies that are are worth uh, observing. And most of these galaxies are about magnitude 9, magnitude 10. Uh, and so really, you could see quite a few of them in, in even a, a modest telescope, three-inch, four-inch telescope. Well, if you find M87, which is the giant elliptical galaxy, then that's sort of the gateway to a very densely packed region. There's a, a, a lovely curving arc of galaxies there called Markarian's Chain, which is rather lovely to look at. But what's really fascinating about it is just if you spend your time and look at those galaxies and just sort of sketch them or photograph them and tick them off the list, it is amazing how you can push yourself to see more and more galaxies. Yes, it's a nice thing to be doing this time of year. Um, actually, Virgo, it's not a very distinctive constellation. However, it does cover a vast amount of the sky. It's the second largest constellation in yes, the entire is. sky. So there's, there's quite a bit there. The brightest star um, is Spica and... Pete thought you always described this as uh, as following the arc to arc to Arcturus and then round on to Spica, don't you? It's quite a. It's the. Easy I think the maxim, yeah, maxim is um, you, so you basically take the handle of the saucepan and extend the arc, the natural arc it makes, away from the saucepan's pan, 
So it said, follow the arc to Arcturus and speed on to Spiker. That's so it. If you ca- continue the arc round, you will arrive at Spiker. And what's interesting there is that Arcturus is distinctly orange. It's the brightest nighttime star in the northern half of the sky. Um, so its orange colour really stands out. And Spiker is really white in colour. Yes, uh, they are qu- quite different stars. Uh, and if you draw a line... Uh, from Spiker to the end of the saucepan's handle and locate the midpoint uh, s- slightly to the right of it. It doesn't look like there's much there r- originally, but as you get more dark adapted, you can see a faint little pattern of stars. This is the constellation of Coma Berenice's or Queen Berenice's hair. And the uh, most notable thing about this faint constellation is that there is a little triangular cluster known as Malot 111, which is actually quite a pretty little cluster. It's lovely. I can remember seeing that when I was a, a boy many years ago. Many, um, many years ago. <laughs> and I just knew you were going to say that. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a very cold, crisp February, I think, a February evening. And there was frost on the rooftops. I can remember it sort of sparkling away. Um, but I picked up a visual view of Milot 111, which is, is distinctly triangular. And the stars sort of sit in that naked eye threshold region so they sort of come into vision and then disappear again and it's it's quite a lovely cluster actually yes i've only ever seen it once or twice actually but with a larger telescope so uh, it wasn't quite uh, as difficult but it, but it is very pretty all right well if you could imagine uh, the arc of the saucepan handle as part of a circle then the centre of that circle would be marked by the star Cor Carioli. And this is the brightest star in the constellation of Cannes Venetici, the hunting dogs who are associated with the constellation of Boertis as they help him keep the two bears in check, presumably, by running around He's a bear barking. herder. He's a bear herder. Presumably the dogs just run around barking or whatever. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know how they'd help, but clearly they, they do in the in, in this story. And in fact, roughly midway between Arcturus and Cor Carioli is a very understated globular cluster, M3, which is... Oh, it's fantastic. It's, it's better than M13, in my opinion. I don't know why it's so overlooked. I agree. Overlooked. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, but to the south of Virgo and Leo, you'll find two rather nice groups of stars riding on the back of the giant and rather indistinct constellation of Hydra, the water snake. You said that Virgo was the second largest. Well, Hydra is the largest, and it's probably the, the least interesting in the sky. <laughs> There's hardly anything in there. Um, the first is Crater the Cup, which is eight fairly faint stars, which pick out the shape of a cup reasonably well, but they are quite faint. Um, but the one which I really like is Corvus the Crow, which is a quite a small constellation. But the the four main stars really do stand out pretty well. And they form an asterism, which is known as the sail, because it looks like the sail of an ancient ship sailing across the horizon. Right. I think it's, <laughs> oh, it's just too low down for me here. I can't really see that. But I'm happy to take your word for it. So uh, if, if that's what it is, that's what it is. Just to the north of Corvus along a line pointed at by both the stars Zeta and Delta Corvi. This is the Sombrero Galaxy can be found here, M104, which is really quite uh, something. This is uh, an edge-on spiral galaxy to us, and there really is quite a distinctive dark lane, dust lane, running through it. Yes, there is. And um, I've actually seen that dust lane in a dark sky with a four-inch telescope, so... Really? That's pretty good going. It was. This wasn't a town. This was in the middle of nowhere. Uh, uh, the moon was out of the way. I'd been dark adapted for hours, so quite difficult to repeat. Yeah, but the the galaxy itself was actually quite quite well defined. I thought it's a nice galaxy. It's a nice galaxy to image. It's quite its shape is quite striking. But um, finally, any discussion of the spring sky, of course, wouldn't be complete without describing the lovely Beehive Cluster, yes. Messier 44, which sits right in the centre of Cancer the Crab. And you can find this open cluster with a naked eye if you have dark skies by drawing a line from the upper twin star, Castor, which is in uh, Gemini the Twins, of course, uh, to Regulus, which is the star we described in Leah the Lion. And M44 lies just to the south of the midpoint of that line. And through binoculars, it's quite glorious, isn't it? It is. Uh, actually, Pete, you're right. Because binoculars, even a small telescope, it's difficult to get all the cluster in. Um, the best views are in the finder scope or, or in binoculars because you can see the whole cluster um, 
it really is quite a stunning sight and does look a little bit like a beehive as well one of those I'll, objects. I'll take your word for that it does <laughs> use a bit of imagination oh come on if you can have uh, fried eggs back to back for the sombrero galaxy I can have this looking like a beehive <laughs> anyway I hope everyone has clear skies there's lots to see in March so thanks very much Pete thank you Paul <laughs>